On 9-11, I was in Norfolk, Virginia. I was stationed I worked at the Pentagon that day. Um, I had been working there about six years at that point. I was actually uh, flying for an airline at the time. I Where was, was I in 9-11? I was in uh, Denver, Colorado. I was stationed at uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base. And I, I was in 10th in grade, Herx High School. New Head Park, New York. 9-11, uh, I was at Offutt Air Force Base. Uh, I was the executive officer. Kunsan uh, Air Base in my dorms. Uh, I was in second period, global studies, we were learning 9 about 9-11, uh, I was in Warner Robins Air Force Base down in Georgia. Ten years ago on September 11th, 2001, terrorists attacked the nation. I got an aunt Linda, she's a uh, a firefighter. She was supposed to be one of the first responders that day, but that day she got called off. Uh, she had a, a kid at home who was sick, so she didn't go down there. The plane beforehand, all the smoke, uh, yeah. Um, hopefully we never have to go through that ever again. Like, I remember the following day, everyone was hauled around TVs, whatever TVs were available in the school. It was nothing got done. I think that 9-11 was a wake-up call for America. I think it was a wake-up call for the military. From that day on, everything changed. Uh, I remember vividly the, the TV was on and uh, we were huddled around it and uh, watching very intently to, to see what happened. So there was a lot of concern. So I remember the day very well. The next live picture was when I saw the second airplane hit the towers and my hair stood on end. How could something in the cockpit goes so wrong, the guy crashes into a building. And we, I, I didn't think terrorism at, the, at first until I saw the second one hit, and I was like, oh, this is not good. I think, uh, I think most of our concerns at that point were, you know, what was, what was the net effect? Was this the end? Were, were, there, were there more attacks? It was like, how dare you? Don't you know who we are? I think when we all sat there and watched the president land, knowing that he was coming to STRATCOM, and that's where you can command and control nuclear weapons from, that's when it really dawned the gravity of how serious um, the president took it and uh, we were at war. Off deployments we went. I don't think anybody at that point was thinking of Iraq but they were definitely thinking Afghanistan and how could we get there. And then the squadron commander came by and said hey get in the crew rest and that night we were flying. No we fight a an enemy that we don't know who they are, where they are, they're all over the world. Uh, they could be at our back door. It was not so much that we were going to mobilize and go to war as a nation, but that we were going to hunt these bastards down. Is force needed? Is a show of force needed? Absolutely. Back then in the 70s and the 80s, we weren't geared up for terrorist attacks. We weren't this was not on our radar at all. After 9-11, we went to the expeditionary construct, and if you didn't deploy, that was an exception. Up front, on the front lines, um, living, breathing, sweating, and bleeding with our sister services. Sign up to serve, you know, to go to war, what have you, whatever your job is. Now I've got an M16 and, you know, um, working on the flight line. That was a cultural shift in our Air Force. That shift to an expeditionary force led to a shift in the way the Air Force conducted operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's a lot of missions that are, in my opinion, too dangerous to send a pilot in there to do, especially if you have the capabilities to, to send in an unmanned airplane that, yeah, you lose the money, but you don't lose the life, and that, that's important. So now you can sustain operations, yet have all the uh, intel resources, the pilots stateside, and you can do those long missions from the states and have a smaller presence on the ground. With these systems, we could watch them working, eating, knowing where they slept, knowing where they traveled. Uh, it allowed us to keep that 24-7 eye in the sky until we were ready to exact justice. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You don't see the other 99% of the stuff that goes on that these folks are doing with their RPAs. They're fighting stuff where we can't go. They're doing stuff that we can't do. All from a single location, like at Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. This base, I believe, is unique because we are in a region that is committed 
to long-term growth of unmanned air systems uh, technology. I don't think there's a, a manned <laughs> airplane that's going to be on this space except coming in transit. But there'll be three different types of, of UAS systems, which is, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's probably anywhere else that has it except for downrange deployed somewhere. Uh, as we go further into the future, you're going to see even more autonomous operations where the, the aircraft will alert me when something's wrong and then I get to deal with that or I get to manage multiple aircraft over time, multiple capabilities over time and you're going to see virtual crews that not only are nearby but they're going to be scattered throughout the globe and we'll all be connected on our headsets. Um, this is the newest, the latest, the greatest technology if you will that's coming to the battlefield. It's not a a revision of old technology, it is the latest technology and it's where the future is going. Today's airmen stood up, volunteered, with the understanding that they may be called upon to be an expeditionary airman, that they would be put in harm's way, that they would deploy to places where they may make the ultimate sacrifice, and yet they continue to serve. That speaks um, it just speaks volumes about the patriotism and the dedication of our airmen today. Uh, and I applaud every airman for their service, for their patriotism, and for their courage to wear our nation's uniform.